We live in a three-dimensional world. We are talking about life in 3D. We're looking at trilogies that appear in the Bible. Today, we look at the three dimensions of God. We call it the Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Paul gives his benediction in the second letter of Corinthians, he speaks of the Trinity when he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Here he mentions the Trinity, the grace of the Lord Jesus who came to save us from our sins, the love of God, love the very nature of God who is love, and the fellowship, the ministry, the partnership of the Holy Spirit who is with us. The foundation of our faith as Christians rests on the fact that there exists only one God. The great commandment begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Then, of course, it goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it begins with this important truth. Hear, O Israel, O people of God, the Lord our God is one. You see, the ancients practiced polytheism, which means many gods. They believed in many different gods. Others looked at the world in terms of pantheism. The word pan means everything, God and everything, even making inanimate objects divine. The Greeks and Romans worshipped a pantheon of mythological beings like Zeus and Aphrodite, Hercules. The true and living God is personal, and he reveals himself to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's one God, but he reveals himself to us in ways we can understand him in the person of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I think we can liken the Trinity to water. There's one essence, water, H2O, a chemical substance, but it can exist in three different forms, liquid, steam, or frozen form, ice. One substance in three forms and expressions. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity, one of the great Christian hymns, sings. He said, well, I don't fully understand that. Well, there's no doubt that understanding God is beyond my level and your level. Even Paul says, we see through a glass darkly in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We're looking at the mystery of God. And we can't get our minds around all that God is and his existence and his power and his will. But he does give us insights in himself. And he reveals himself in ways that you and I can understand. And we understand fathers because we have parents. We understand the son because we're children in a relationship in a father and a son. We can understand the Holy Spirit, God's presence, his abiding presence with us, the sense that God is always with us. The Trinity is both mysterious and meaningful, enabling us to comprehend and to experience the fullness of God. Even though I don't fully understand the Trinity, I'm comforted by the fact that God has revealed himself to us, that I can pray to God as Father. I'm grateful that Jesus, the Son of God, came to save me from my sins. And I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit abides with me and is always here to help me. So in that sense, just like you, I don't fully understand the Trinity, but I believe it because that's how God revealed himself to us in Scripture. And Jesus taught us about the Trinity many times in his relationship to God, and he spoke about the coming of the Spirit. Even though I don't fully grasp it, I grasp enough of it that it means so much to me. And I pray that it means so much to you that you understand God is your Father. Jesus Christ came to save you from your sins, and the Holy Spirit is with you. You're never alone. Now, Jesus told us to baptize believers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in Matthew 28 and 19. So that was the commission Jesus gave to us. We call it the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and baptizing them. Here's the Trinity. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now here in Corinthians, Paul uses the Trinity to remind us of the blessings of God in our life. And when we look at this benediction, we understand what the Trinity means to us. First of all, it means that we have experienced the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every word in that phrase is important. Grace, we'll talk about that. And Jesus is Lord. Jesus means Savior and Christ means Messiah. Every word, every title in that phrase is meaningful. Grace means a free gift. So think about that. Grace, 
gift. That's what it means in its essence. Grace means a gift given freely. It's sometimes it's called the unmerited favor of God. In other words, the blessing of God that we don't earn. God just gives it to us, the gift. Grace means the blessings of God upon our lives. Now, grace is the motive of God. In other words, God does what he does for us because of grace, as opposed to us trying to earn things from God. As sometimes religions say, well, you've got to earn God's favor. You've got to pray for God's favor. You've got to work for, no. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is that God is a God of grace. He's the God of all grace, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Think about that. He's the God of all grace. All these false gods that, and I that people will have no grace. All grace resides in the person of God. And it came into the world through Jesus. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, from the fullness of his, God's grace, have we all received one blessing after another? You can translate that grace upon grace, wave and wave of grace. All of us, sinner and saint alike, religious and unreligious, believing and unbelieving, all of us, all humanity, is constantly receiving one blessing after the other. From the fullness of God's grace, we've all received one blessing after another. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1, 16 and 17. Now, the grace of Jesus is displayed in his atonement because here Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the grace of God, which is his nature and the motive of everything God does, took expression in his son, Jesus. And Jesus became Lord through his death, burial, and resurrection. He died as our Savior. He rose again as Lord of all. So the grace of Jesus is displayed. You say, how can I understand grace? It's displayed in his atonement for our sins and his resurrection for our salvation. So it is the cross that is the measure of grace and the resurrection that is the measure of grace. It's what Jesus Christ did for us, dying for our sins and rising again to show that we have eternal life. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, so that no one can boast. What an amazing passage that is. We're saved by grace, not by earning it. It's a gift. Saved by grace through faith. As soon as we put our faith in Jesus, we experience the saving grace. And he says, it's not of works. We don't work our way to heaven. We don't add anything to grace. And, and your good works, which are fantastic to do, but it doesn't add to grace. Your prayers don't add to grace. Caring for those in need, important that we do that. It doesn't add to grace, though. You're not making yourself more saved. Works don't make us more saved. We're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. And grace enables us and empowers us to do good works, to help others and to glorify God. But we're not doing good works to get something. We are doing good works because we've received something. And that's different. Everything God does in our lives is because he loves us and he gives it to us. That's God's motive. And once we receive grace, grace becomes our motive for everything we do, as opposed to trying to earn something. Because you can't earn the blessings of God. They come free. You receive them by faith. As we look at this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that the grace of Jesus in us and for us supplies everything we need. So many times we think about grace only as the power to save us from our sins and to give us assurance of heaven. But we live on grace as God's people every day, and you can depend on grace. There's, there's a form of grace that you can receive by trusting God in every area of your life. The grace of Jesus will supply Everything you need in your life. Second Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, May the God of all grace, may he make all grace increase to you. May God make all grace increase to you. That means to overflow. You could translate the word, may he make all grace abound to you. That means like a river when it gets so filled with water during the rain that overflows the banks. That's what abundance means. That's what increase means in the scripture. It's an amazing prayer. It's an amazing blessing. It's an amazing truth. May the God of grace make all grace abound to you so that at all times in every way, having all that you need, you will increase or abound in every good work. That's an amazing promise. That God is able, he says. God has the power. 
and God is willing. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that at all times, in every way, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Whatever need you have in your life today, you can go before the Lord in prayer and ask him for grace. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. There's a grace that God will impart to you if you will just come to the throne of grace and go before God in prayer and faith and then receive the grace of God. So the Trinity becomes very meaningful for us when we understand that the Trinity means that we have experienced and are experiencing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the second part of this Trinitarian blessing is the love of God. So when we think of God as a Trinity, we think of God the Father. The one essential quality of God is love. So love is the nature of God. The Bible says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love, 1 John 4 and 8. You say, well, how do I know what the love of God looks like? Well, it's measured by the cross. John continues and he writes, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. Whenever you feel like God doesn't love you, just close your eyes and look at the cross. Look at Jesus dying on the cross for your sins, taking your judgment. Listen to Jesus praying for the crucifix. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you don't think you're very valuable, look at the cross. That shows you how valuable you are to God. The cross is the cure for people's low self-esteem and negative self-image. How can you look at the cross and Jesus giving his life to save you and feel like you don't matter to God? Or you feel like you're not worth anything? No, the cross is the measurement of God's love. You know the greatest statement Jesus ever made, the greatest verse in the Bible. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love of God is measured at the cross. Don't ever doubt the love of God. Look at the cross. You'll see how much God loves you. Love frees us from fear. When you know that God loves you, you won't be nearly as anxious and worried. The apostle John continues, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one, the person who fears is not made perfect in love. And perfect there means mature. First John 4 and 18, the more that you grow spiritually, the more you grow to understand and accept that God loves you, the less anxious you're going to feel because you know that God is watching over you. God is protecting you. God is working in your life. God loves you. And when you know that, it will drive fear out of your heart. And the Bible says that God's love gives us a greater capacity to love. Once we know love and begin to see ourselves as loved and know how much God loves us, we start loving each other better. That love pours out. John tells us we love because he first loved us. First John 4, 19. We have the capacity to love others. Even so, it's so that Jesus says, love your enemies. You see, you have the capacity to love. And the more that you will think about the love of God and accept the love of God and rejoice in the love of God and realize how much God overlooks in our lives, you praise him for his mercy and love, you'll become more merciful and loving toward others. And so will I. You see, God's love compels us to love others. John tells us in 1 John 4, 21, and he, God, has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So the Trinity is more than this mysterious concept. Now we begin to understand that God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we can understand him and that we can relate to God. Now the Trinity is taking on meaning for us, isn't it? We realize, well, that means that Jesus came to give me the grace of God and that Jesus has grace for everything I need. And salvation is a free gift. I don't have to earn my way to heaven. And then we've discovered that this God, the Father that Jesus told us about, loves us above all things. God loves us so much that John says he is love. And when you know the love of God, you're going to be free from so much worry and anxiety, trusting that God is going to take care of you. And you're going to become more loving to others the more you grow in the love of God. 
And the third part of the Trinity is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is God. He's always existed part of the triune Godhead. Very dawn of creation, the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's the Holy Spirit appearing in the first three verses of Genesis. But Jesus said he was going to send the Holy Spirit in a new way, not the first time, but in a new way. The Holy Spirit came in a new way at Pentecost. Forty days after Jesus' ascension to heaven, Acts 2, verse 1 through 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit, who is God with us, God in us, he gives us spiritual power. Think about that. We're so weak in ourselves, but we can learn to depend upon the Spirit, and the Spirit will give us energy and power and ability beyond our ability. Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the word fellowship here means that the Spirit gives us a communion with God. It also is the word for partnership. Think about that. The Holy Spirit is your partner to help you. Jesus talked about in this way in John 14, verse 16 to 70. He said, I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another comforter, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. He said, I'm going to ask the father and he's going to give you another counselor. You could translate it comforter. It really means helper. It's what that word means in the Greek language, the paraclete in the Greek, para, to come alongside, kaleo. He's summoned by God, called by God to come right beside you and me and to help us. That's what the comforter or the counselor means. The Holy Spirit is a helper. And when we're born again, he lives in us and he helps us in our weaknesses and he helps us to live victoriously. Even Paul says in Romans 8 and 26, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Think about that. All the weaknesses we have, the Holy Spirit is with us to help us. John sums up the power and the presence of the Spirit of God who is with us and who is in us in 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. So this is the mystery of the Trinity and the meaning of the Trinity. And so don't get lost and try to completely understand it. Accept the revelation of God, one God who's revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you're living this life Every day with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Join me for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the revelation of yourself to us. And I pray that each of us today, they have a greater understanding of what it means to be your children, of how much you love us and care for us and protect us and are always with us. Bless your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining me for this time of studying the Word of God. I'm really enjoying it. I pray you are this series of teachings on life in 3D. And what an amazing teaching today as we've delved in a little bit of trying to understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in 3D. Do me a favor, download the Mount Perrin app today on your phone. Let's stay connected. And also go and subscribe to my sermon podcast. Always like and subscribe and share with others as well the Word of God. Thank you for your faithful support of the Mount Perry ministry. Those of you that give tithes and offerings, your gifts are so powerful to support the work of the church here and around the world. Thank you for your generosity. If you've not started giving to the Mount Perry ministry, I trust that you'll prayerfully consider what you can do to support our ministry as we carry the gospel of Jesus to the world. You can give on the app. You can give on the Mount Perry website. It's easy to give, but I'd like to ask you to prayerfully consider supporting the work of the ministry as you are able and as God leads you. Thank you for your faithful partnership in ministry. Sunday, the greatest day of the week is coming up and I'm looking forward to seeing you and your family for worship. God bless you. Have a great day.